Hello friends, this is Mike. I created this video to bring together three of my recent presentations having to do with what appears to be further disclosure by Billy in his role as Paul McCartney. The three presentations are Decoding McCartney 3, The Memoirs of Paul McCartney, and the third, Does Paul McCartney Time Out on February 21st, 2023. By combining the three videos, it will be easier to see the progression that I believe is taking place. Thanks for watching. Hello friends, this is Mike Williams. With this presentation, I will offer my thoughts and insights into Billy's new album, McCartney 3, which was released on December 18th of 2020. I would like to thank those of you who forwarded me information which helped to compile this presentation. As is always the case with William, McCartney 3, especially the album art, is chock full of occult clues. I will also comment on the new Let It Be film by Peter Jackson, which is scheduled to be released in 2021. Before we move on, please note this presentation is about the Beatles and the McCartney conspiracy, so if this topic is not your cup of tea or it makes you upset, I highly recommend clicking the stop button and moving to content that better aligns with your beliefs about who and what the Beatles were and continue to be. For everyone else, thanks for being here. Let's move to the first slide and begin the analysis. This article comes to us from the Daily Mail, and I call this the Kool-Aid version of the McCartney 3 backstory. It has very little to do, in my opinion, with the real motivations behind the release of the album. The article is titled, Sir Paul McCartney Made His New Album in Lockdown by Accident. In this article, Billy tells us his 18th solo album, McCartney 3, was somewhat of a happy accident. He goes on to say, he wrote and recorded it during lockdown earlier this year, and he didn't realize what he was creating when he did it, and says, I wasn't trying to make an album, so suddenly I had these 10 songs. I didn't know I was making an album. Well, I think there might be more to the story as we will soon see, but before we dive in, let's take a look at some fun, if not quirky, Macca moments. Here's an image of Billy posing for what is obviously a staged photo with his face wrapped. And part of his merch for McCartney 3 is a Macca mask for those that want to add a little fab to the ritual. This is an image that was sent to me by a listener. And I don't know if it's been doctored or photoshopped. Sometimes it's very difficult to tell. But whether the image is real or not, it is funny. We see he's at a function and he has a name tag which says Billy. So I zoomed in on the tag, which you can see on the right, and there it is. And for good measure, I reversed the contrast to get another view. So welcome Billy to the presentation. Let's take a moment and set the table a bit before we get into the details. McCartney 3 is Billy's 18th solo album, and of course, 18 reduces to the number 9. Dice, in its singular form, is called a die. The three dots on the die can have multiple references, including the trinity, the three sides of a triangle or pyramid, the three phases of the Beatles, and Billy's three personas comprised of biological Paul, himself, and the role he plays of Paul McCartney. The die is also a cube that has six sides and symbolizes Saturn worship and Luciferianism. Also, when we count the dots on the die's reflection, we get double threes, or 33, representing the 33 degrees of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, as well as the numbers 6 and 9, where 9 is the number associated with Billy playing the role of Paul McCartney. And when we combine the name McCartney with the die, we get McCartney die, cluing us in that Paul is dead, and perhaps... Billy is also hinting that he himself is reaching the end of his life. Let's move to the next slide and discuss the three phases of the Beatles. The first phase was the pre-1962 time frame where Pete Best and Stuart Sutcliffe were in the band. This was the bar and club period where the Beatles were being prepped for the role Tavistock had them slotted for. This was a time when they were continuously playing live in order to strengthen their playing skills in preparation of what was ahead of them once they connected with George Martin in 1962. 
The second phase began in the latter part of 62, when Pete Best was replaced by Ringo as the drummer. This took place right before they signed with EMI Parlophone and began working under the tutelage of George Martin. This period had the lads learning the songs written for them, as well as credited to them, as they took the music on the road to a worldwide audience with major tours and generating the first seven albums, starting with Please Please Me and ending with Revolver in 1966. This period, which I refer to as the Biopaul period, was a major deliverable in the psychological operations timeline as it established the Beatles as a worldwide phenomenon and putting Tavistock's social engineering agenda into overdrive. The third phase was the Billy era, and this part of the timeline was designed to focus solely on studio work as Billy kicks off the psychedelic period with Sgt. Pepper, which was released on June 1, 1967. As I have discussed in many other presentations and shows, the Beatles were Freemasons and immersed in Masonic occult symbolism. If we look at the lower left of the chart, I have an image of Stuart Sutcliffe going back to the Phase 1 period, where he is making a Masonic hand gesture which I will explain in a moment. In the middle of the slide, we see the Phase 2 Beatles, where all of them are displaying the Masonic lion's paw, a symbol which refers to personal transformation and spiritual enlightenment within the teachings of Freemasonry. The Beatles' 1962 through 1966 Red Album and the 1967 through 1970 Blue Album are representative of the Red and Blue Lodges of Freemasonry. Okay, so let's take a closer look at Stuart Sutcliffe's Masonic hand gesture and what is being symbolized. The symbol Stuart is flashing is the cube. The cube is a symbol of Saturn. Also, when we draw a line through the center of the die, we create two triangles and can make correlations to the alchemical symbols of the four elements, which are air, fire, earth, and water, each of which has its own characteristics while also aligning to the signs of the zodiac. For the purposes of this discussion, I will focus on the meaning of the cube. The cube has six sides and in the occult represents Saturn, which is the sixth planet. The cube is also represented as a hexagon. When we connect the six points of a hexagon, a three-dimensional cube emerges. At first, it might be hard to see, but if you look at the image of the hexagon at the bottom left of the slide, and then look at the black die to the right, you should see the correlation. We are told by NASA that at the north pole of Saturn, there is a hexagon-shaped formation. Now, whether you believe NASA or not is not the point. Instead, we should ask ourselves, why is NASA, which was founded on occultism, showing us the hexagon? And what they are telling us is the hexagon is a cube, and the cube, or more specifically, the black cube, is a reference to Saturn. Saturn worship is associated with Luciferianism. This is why we see large black cubes across the world. The image on the right shows giant cubes on display in Australia, Denmark, Manhattan, and Santa Ana. Why is this? It's because Saturn worship, or Luciferianism, is the spiritual belief system and ideology of the controllers. For anyone interested in why the controllers worship Saturn, I will leave a link in the description box to my October 2020 presentation in Greenville, South Carolina, where I cover this topic and offer my theory. And now let's take a look at another well-known cube. Many people are familiar with the Kaaba in Mecca. It is the most sacred site in Islam. And as we can see, it is a large cube. In fact, the word Kaaba, which sounds similar to Kabbalah, means cube. When Muslims make their pilgrimage to Mecca, Part of the ritual is to walk around the Kaaba, forming a ring, symbolizing the rings of Saturn. Saturn is the Lord of the Rings. And I will tie this out later in the presentation when we discuss Peter Jackson and his work on the new Let It Be film. Now let's take a look at how the cube ties into Billy. As I mentioned, along with the die being the singular form of dice, it is also being used by Billy as a Polish dead clue. I covered how a hexagon which has six sides becomes a cube when displayed in 3D format, as well as the hexagon and the cube being symbols for Saturn. So along with Billy using the cube symbolism to represent his spiritual philosophy of Luciferianism, he is also using wordplay 
to tell us biological Paul, or McCartney, the name at the top of the album, is dead. When we look at the album cover, we have the name McCartney at the top, and then below McCartney, we have the die. And when we connect the name with the symbol, we are being told McCartney die, or Paul die, or Paul is dead. This clue takes us back to the Sgt. Pepper album cover and the drum clue. When the drum is mirrored, as we see in the red circled area on the right, we get the words, he die. And look what's between he and die. A diamond shaped character or a cube consisting of two connected triangles. Can you see what Billy did? He linked his new album, McCartney 3, back to his first Beatles album, Sgt. Pepper, where he introduces himself as Billy Shears. It's quite clever. Now for anyone who thinks this is all coincidence, here are two images showing the hexagon or cube during two different Beatle phases. The image on the left has Bio Paul from Phase 2 standing on and framed in a black hexagon or black cube. The image on the right is Billy from Phase 3, photographed inside a black framed hexagon or black cube. It's not coincidence, my friends. Now, the hexagon is also symbolic of carbon-6, which is the element with the atomic number 6 on the periodic table represented by the symbol of C. This non-metallic element is the key to the chemistry of living organisms. Carbon is the basis for organic chemistry and the second most abundant of the 11 elements found in the human body after oxygen. So the hexagon, or the cube, is also representative of life. Please note the upper right image, where we see the Star of David, which is created by bringing together two overlapping triangles, which forms a six-pointed star, and six smaller triangles with a hexagon in the middle. It should also be noted that when we add the atomic number six to the letter C, which is the third letter in the alphabet, we get six plus three, which equals nine. Since the world is run by occultists, everything the controllers display and present has occulted meaning. We know that Islam via the Kaaba and Judaism via the Star of David have the cube embedded in their religions, but what about Christianity? Well, here we can see, when we unfold the cube, it forms a cross. Now that we have a better understanding of the cube, let's circle back to the McCartney 3 album cover. When analyzing the album art, I noticed the numbers 3, 6, and 9 are very prominent. There is a quote attributed to Nikola Tesla that says, If you only knew the magnificence of the 3, 6, and 9, then you would have the key to the universe. Obviously, the title of the album itself, McCartney 3, and the die with three dots represents the number 3. But the die is also a cube and symbolizes the number six because it has six sides. We also find the number six by adding together the three dots on the die to the three dots in its reflection. We get the number nine from the name McCartney, which contains nine letters. For anyone who has followed my work or read memoirs, you know that when Billy's playing the role of Paul McCartney, he's about the nines. And when he is William, or himself, he's all about the sixes. The number three represents a direct link to source or the universe. It's a number that also represents the Trinity. Six represents the strength within ourselves and is also the number of man. Nine is in accordance with moving on from the past and experiencing transformation and change. Three, six, and nine are also fundamental to vortex math, which is a theory that posits these numbers represent a vector between the third and fourth dimension. Therefore, 3, 6, and 9 are considered higher dimensional energy which influence other numbers and are instrumental in the creation and existence of the universe. McCartney 3, with its simple artwork, is in fact displaying Billy's deep understanding of the esoteric and occult knowledge. Billy loves the number 9, and he embeds it along with his other favorite occult numbers like 3, 6, 9, 11, and 33 anywhere he can. But 9 is clearly his favorite number. McCartney 3 is Billy's 18th solo album, and of course, 1 plus 8 equals 9. 
The album was originally going to be released on December 11th, 2020. When we add the numbers for the month, the day, and the year, it reduces to 9. When the album was delayed, he chose a date that also regroups to 9, and he did so in a very clever way. The final release date of the album was December 18th, 2020, and to get to 9, he took the month of December, which is 12, or 1 plus 2, summing to 3, and then the day, which was the 18th, which reduces to 9, and multiply the two. So the month times the day is 3 times 9, which equals 27, and when we add 2 plus 7, we get 9. But what about the year? What he did to make sure the entire date regrouped to 9 was this. He took the year 2020, which reduces to 4, and then multiplied the 4 by the 9 from the month and day calculation. Therefore, 4 times 9 equals 36, and 3 plus 6 equals 9. Now let's break down the album cover even more. The first thing we notice is the black and white motif, which represents duality. We then see the album cover is divided in half. The upper half has a black background, and the lower half is a shade of white. This symbolizes two realms, the spirit world and the physical world. It also represents as above, so below. The name McCartney, which represents the number nine, is centered in the spirit realm, symbolizing that biological Paul is dead and this is where his spirit resides. As I covered earlier in this presentation, the three dots represent three personas, that of biological Paul, Billy as himself, and Billy as Paul McCartney. If we look closely, we can see the die is not centered on the horizontal between the two realms. The die is, in fact, nudged above the horizon. With this depiction, I believe Billy is telling us that because of his age, he turned 83 this year, that his time on the physical plane is coming to an end, and his own passing is on the horizon. The die, which represents a cube, the hexagon and Saturn, and symbolic of the number six, represents Billy, since he tells us in memoirs he is all about the sixes. Going back to three, six, and nine, three is represented by the three in the title of the album, as well as the three dots on the die. Six is represented by the cube with its six sides, and of course the name McCartney contains nine letters. When we put it all together, we have three, six, and nine. The mirrored die also represents double threes, which is symbolic of 33, or the 33 degrees of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. We can also add the threes from 33 and get six, or multiply the threes and derive nine. As we can see, what appears to be a simple album cover is loaded up with occult symbolism. Now let's take a look at the back of the album. In the first callout, we see Billy's profile set up against the sky with clouds. This recalls the song Fool on a Hill with the lyric, Well on his way, head in a cloud. The song Fool on a Hill is symbolic of the Fool card in the tarot deck. Billy is the Fool on the Hill. The Fool represents new beginnings, having faith in the future, being inexperienced, not knowing what to expect, having beginner's luck improvising, and believing in the universe. Now take a moment and think about the task Billy took on when he replaced Bio Paul and his journey, and the Fool card makes perfect sense. The album contains 11 songs, and of course, this was intentional. The album also has a total runtime, which regroups to 11, and I will cover this in an upcoming slide. In box three, we have the title of the album McCartney 3, which in numerical form is 9 times 3, or 27, and 2 plus 7 equals 9. McCartney 3 is also placed in the sky above Billy's head, symbolizing Biopaul in the heavens, and as I mentioned earlier, possibly representing Billy's own death and ascension to the spirit world. When we add the numbers contained inside the barcode, we again get the number 11. If we move to the image on the right, we have the back of a Japanese CD edition of the album, and we can see Billy with his eyes closed, symbolizing being at rest. The Japanese edition contains bonus songs, 
bringing the total number of songs to 15, which regroups to 6. And the barcode on the Japanese CD, which has different numbers than the barcode on the album cover to the left, also tallies to 11. Coincidence? I don't think so, but you can decide for yourself. I also noticed the sky and cloud symbolism on the back cover is very similar to Lennon's Imagine album, which was released in 1971. Within nine years of releasing Imagine, John Lennon departed. This got me thinking. Is the sky and cloud symbolism a clue as to how much time Billy has left in the physical world? Let's play with some numbers and see what we find. Imagine was released on October 11, 1971. I should note that October 11th was the same day the Beatles began the Rubber Soul sessions. The date is important because it represents triple ones, as well as the number three. Now, set aside whether you believe Lennon actually died or not. From the standpoint of the occultist, a symbolic death and an actual death serve the same purpose as it depicts endings and subsequent rebirth. I should also point out that December 8, 1980, the day of Lennon's death, reduces to 9-11. We get this by taking December, or 12, which is 1 plus 2, and sums to 3, and then adding the 3 to the day, which is 8, and we get 11. And then, when we add the numbers in the year 1980, we get 18, or 1 plus 8, which totals to 9. So Lennon's death was an encoded 9-11 event. I began to wonder, if the 3,347 days from the release of Imagine to Lennon's death could have any occult significance or hidden meaning. So I took a look. Thinking it might be possible that the sky and cloud imagery could be a countdown, I added 3,347 days to the release of McCartney 3, which takes us out to February 16, 2030, which is a little over nine years into the future. For those of us who keep a pulse on the controllers and their agenda, we know the year 2030 is a very important date to the elites with regard to their overall deliverables and as an Agenda 21 checkpoint. I then calculated the time between Billy's date of birth, which I have theorized is September 9, 1937, a date that also regroups to 9-11, and the date of February 16, 2030. And the result is intriguing. If we round the numbers, we get 33,000 days between Billy's date of birth and February 16, 2030. This time frame can also be calculated as 92 years or 1,109 months. Since rounding is very common when we discuss age, I found it interesting that the calculations resulted in the numbers 33, 11, and 911. Now, this is not a prediction. It's a what-if exercise I decided to run based on the sky and cloud symbolism on the back of Billy's album and the cover of Lennon's Imagine. I'm thinking there might be a correlation since nothing the controllers do is left to chance and everything they do is based in the occult. When folks have asked me my thoughts on when I think Billy might depart this world, I lean toward 90 because of his fixation on the number 9. But 92 which reduces to 11, works just as well. Here's a screen capture of a scheduled interview Billy did with Chris Rock. Notice how the time of 11.45 reduces to 9.11, and how the date of December 17th regroups to 11. As I continue to examine the numbers, I took a look at Billy's McCartney 1, 2, and 3 albums and found some interesting results. If we look at the blue call-out boxes, we can see that all three albums have run times that reduce to 11. I can tell you this is not by chance, especially across three albums. To do this, there was quite a bit of planning, and therefore, it is by design. Then I reviewed the release dates for these albums, and when I looked at the release date of April 17, 1970 for McCartney 1, I found the date total to 11. For McCartney 2, the release date of May 16, 1980 reduces to 3, and I will show you in a moment 
why I believe he chose the number three for that album and what it symbolizes. And last, I mentioned earlier in the presentation the release date of McCartney 3 regroups to 9. Like the runtimes, the release dates were very thought out in order to tie back to occult numerology. Here is why I believe the release date for McCartney 2 reduces to 3. The album cover shows Billy, as well as two shadows to the left and right of his head, symbolizing three personas. One persona is the center image representing Billy playing the role of Paul McCartney. The shadow images represent two other personas, that of biological Paul, as well as Billy himself as William. So Billy is telling us he is a blending or the embodiment of bio-Paul, a disembodied soul, as well as himself, an incarnate soul, both of which are integrated into the character he plays as Paul McCartney. This is also why Billy has displayed images of his feet in sandals, and I will explain this in a moment. We again see the 9-11 symbolism when we decode the top right text containing the name of the album, McCartney 2, where McCartney, as we know, contains nine letters, and the two is symbolizing 11. Therefore, McCartney 2 represents 9-11, as well as the master number 11. So the release date reducing to three is linked to the three personas that make up Billy and why the McCartney 2 album cover depicts three people. Now one more slide on numbers, just in case there are still people watching who think it's all coincidence. I already showed the run times of the McCartney 1, 2, and 3 albums, all summed to 11. But let's take a moment and focus on McCartney 1 and look at the beginning and end dates of the recording of the album to see if there are any numerical patterns. Billy began recording McCartney 1 on December 1, 1969, and recording ended on February 25, 1970. From beginning to end, Billy spent 87 days recording the album. We can also state the 87 days as 2 months and 25 days. This is interesting because 87 is 8 plus 7, which equals 15, which is 1 plus 5, summing to 6, or the number Billy associates with himself. Also, 2 months and 25 days sums to 9, the number which represents Billy playing the role of Paul McCartney. So we have 6 and 9, or the numerical representations of William and biological Paul. But the numbers get even more interesting. If we look at the call-out box on the right-hand side of the chart, we can see the 87 days when calculated in seconds reduces to 9, which is also the case for total minutes and hours, while the total number of days as well as total weeks regroups to 6. Very well planned indeed. And remember, in the occult, 6s and 9s can be flipped where 6 becomes 9 and 9 becomes 6, or as Jimi Hendrix sang, if 6 was 9. All right, we're not going to bother with the weather. Just look out of the window. Oh, you want the weather? It's the degrees here. have changed. Oh, this is a nice degree. The temperature's 69. Get it? Yeah? Humidity is 90%, number 9. That's all right. Barometer 30.013. That's another 9. Inches and falling. Inches and falling. That sounds like a song. Wind, southeast at 6. See, it's all 6 and 9s. Very deep, man. Very deep. See, it's all six and nines, very deep, man, very deep. Now let's talk about Billy's feet. A number of people reached out to me asking if the photo inside the McCartney 3 gatefold is showing six toes. So I enlarged the image to take a look and concluded the picture of his right foot is inconclusive. It's another example where I believe Billy is being coy and intentionally obscuring or masking the details. I see five toes. What some folks believe might be a possible sixth toe appears to be beach sand on the sandal strap. Now, that being said, it doesn't mean there's not a sixth toe hidden by the sandal. Setting aside five toes versus six toes, let's understand why Billy shows us his feet so many times. It does seem weird, but it makes sense once we know that the feet symbolize aspects of the soul. The foot without a shoe symbolizes a disembodied soul. The foot with a shoe 
represents an embodied soul. Thus, a shoe takes on the symbolism of the body and is symbolic of form. Since sandals partially cover the feet, Billy is telling us he is comprised of both an embodied and disembodied soul. The embodied part of him is himself or William, and the disembodied part of him is biological Paul. So William and Paul are the personas behind the third personality, that being the character of Paul McCartney. This ties back to the McCartney 2 album cover we spoke about in the previous slide. And by the way, even if Billy has five toes, his feet are very different than biological Paul's. In Billy's Find My Way video, which is a song from McCartney 3, we see lots of mirroring where he's playing both left-handed and right-handed. This is more symbolism reflecting the two personas he embodies. The left-handed version of Billy is Paul, and when he plays right-handed, he is William. In the occult, mirroring is also referred to as scrying. When an occultist combines energies such as the sun, the moon, and water, this is believed to give the practitioner the ability to call on or use specific spirits or energies through the mirror, which is considered a portal. Billy's Find My Way video is filled with occult symbolism. Billy has occasionally dropped clues to let us know he is not left-handed and thus not Paul McCartney. The image to the left is Billy playing right-handed from the Find My Way video. To the right is a screen capture from Anthology where we again see him playing right-handed. In the center is an image I captured when his book Hey Grand Dude was released where we can see a book signing poster showing him holding the bass right-handed. In the video, Billy is playing left-handed and the clip is mirrored to show him playing right-handed. I came to this conclusion because his wedding band is on his left ring finger throughout the video. In the screen capture above to the left, we see his wedding ring is on his right hand, which means the video was mirrored since wedding bands are worn on the left ring finger. I know this is hard to see in the image above, but if you slow the playback on the video to 25%, you should see the ring. I believe this to be the case with the scene from Anthology as well. It's important to note that in his public appearances, which includes videos, Billy is going to play left-handed. But also keep in mind, a music video is not the recording of the song. In memoirs, Billy tells us he records right-handed. I had a person contact me who did work with Billy back in the 1980s. When this person walked into the studio, they found Billy playing his guitar right-handed. My contact was curious at his ability to play so adeptly from the right side and asked him about it. Billy replied that since left-handed guitars were hard to come by in the early days, that he learned to play both ways. Of course, his explanation made no sense. All a left-handed guitarist needs to do is reverse the string orientation and then flip the right-handed guitar around so it can be played left-handed, just as Jimi Hendrix did. His response was as nonsensical as his explanation as to why he walked barefoot across Abbey Road on a hot day. We all know this story. He explained it was so hot that he took off his sandals. Well, if it was so hot, you would keep your sandals on, otherwise you run the risk of burning your feet. The reason Billy was barefoot for the Abbey Road photo shoot was because he was supposed to be barefoot. And the reason he was playing right-handed in the studio is because he is right-handed. Here's another capture from Billy's Find My Way video. Here we see him inside the pyramid symbolizing his philosophy and allegiance. And we also have the left-handed, right-handed mirroring once again. The pyramid image appears 42 seconds into the video with 3 minutes and 8 seconds remaining. 4 plus 2 equals 6 and 3 plus 8 equals 11. And when we multiply 6 times 11, we get 66 or the number of degrees that Billy tells us via memoirs that make up the Pyramid of Power. The image on the right has 25 images. When we add 2 plus 5, we get 7, which in the occult represents the number of the enlightened human. Let me take a moment and offer my opinion on the music and lyrics of the album. Now, what makes music resonate with someone is very subjective so what appeals to me may not appeal to another. So my words are not to be viewed as a review or critique of the music, it's just my personal opinion. 
I purchased the vinyl version of McCartney 3. I found the production of the album, including the pressing of the vinyl itself, to be excellent. In fact, the vinyl pressing is audiophile quality. Overall, I found the songwriting to be okay. Musically, nothing stood out for me, but it is a decent album. I do factor in that Billy is 83, and after 60 or so years of performing, I feel compelled to cut him some slack. As an example, because of his age, his voice is not what it used to be, so I'm not expecting to hear vocals from his Wings days. So I try to set reasonable expectations. His performance on the album, if he did indeed play all the instruments, is very good. As I mentioned, there are 11 songs, and the lyrics are personal and introspective. He sounds like a man who is reflecting back on his life. The lyrics do not come across as down or sad, but thoughts coming from a man who, whether you love him or hate him, has had one unbelievable and colorful life. Some of the songs I found interesting were Long-Tailed Winter Bird, where I believe Billy is alluding to the three personas I have discussed in this presentation. Find My Way, he includes a lyric where he walks toward the light. In the song Sliding, Billy tells us he is who he wants to be. The song Deep Deep Feeling is very reflective. The song The Kiss of Venus is a reference to the morning star or Lucifer. And I liked Seize the Day, where the title itself is self-explanatory. The last song, Winter Bird When Winter Comes, begins with the lyric, Must fix the fence by the acre plot, two young foxes have been nosing around. And this had some of us wondering, if Billy is referring to the standing stone on his farm, with the two young foxes being John Lennox and his wife who visited the farm as part of Steve Farber's research into the stone. It's just a thought. So overall, I found the album to be enjoyable. Let's now move to the McCartney 3 summary slide and then I will share some thoughts on the new Let It Be film by Peter Jackson. So in summary, McCartney 3 is Billy's 18th solo album and of course, the 18 reduces to 9. The McCartney 3 album art contains occult symbolism. There are Paul is Dead clues, but also clues suggesting Billy is preparing for his transition from the physical world to the spirit world. The die on the album cover represents a cube or hexagon and is symbolic of Saturn worship and Luciferianism, which is Billy's spiritual philosophy. The numbers 3, 6, and 9 are prominent, symbolizing higher levels of consciousness. The master numbers of 11 and 33 are also embedded. Billy's Find My Way music video is filled with occult symbolism. And the song lyrics from the album come across as personal, introspective, and reflective as Billy looks back on his life. Now let's take a look into the new Let It Be film by Peter Jackson. Many Beatle fans know that a new Let It Be film is in production, which is currently scheduled to be released in August of 2021. The director of the film is Peter Jackson. Here's a synopsis of his background, which comes from Wikipedia, along with my own commentary. Peter is a New Zealand film director, producer, and screenwriter. He is best known as the director, writer, and producer of the Lord of the Rings trilogy and the Hobbit trilogy. And back earlier in his presentation, I mentioned that Saturn is also known as the Lord of the Rings. Peter has the title of Sir Peter Jackson, which means he has been knighted. He has received the Order of New Zealand and the New Zealand Order of Merit, both of which are in recognition of outstanding service to the Crown, so Peter is clearly in the club. Jackson announced that he will direct a documentary film about the making of the Beatles' final album, Let It Be. And to add my own footnote, technically speaking, Abbey Road was the final Beatles album to be recorded. He's going to transform the footage with modern production techniques to display a new side of a period on the Beatles' history, which is usually remembered as highly conflictual. The Wikipedia entry goes on to say that most, that's an interesting word, most of the footage used was originally recorded for the 1970 Let It Be documentary. The article goes on to say that the film is created around 56 hours of never-before-seen footage and 140 hours of audio made available to Jackson's team, which is the only footage of any note that documents them at work in the studio. Now, isn't that an interesting sentence? It reads like they're saying 
This is the only content showing the Beatles actually working in the studio over the band's entire timeline from 1962 through 1969. If this is the case, how is it for the most famous band in the world that there's only 56 hours of film footage, which equates to less than five days, and by the way, 56 reduces to 11, and only 140 hours or approximately six days of audio. And that's the only footage that documents them in the studio of note? Personally, I would be far more impressed if someone showed me proof of their writing, rehearsing, and recording the Rubber Soul album. But we know that's not going to happen. Anyway, Disney acquired the distribution rights and the film is currently scheduled for an August 2021 release. So, what we have going on here, in my opinion, is an effort to buff up the fictional narrative of the Beatles and to rewrite history as a group of fun-loving, lovable lads who always got along, even in the end. When in fact, the original Let It Be film captured the true atmosphere of the sessions and where the Beatles were at mentally as a band. In memoirs, Billy tells us his relationship with the band had its ups and downs throughout his tenure starting in 1966. Also in memoirs, Billy tells us it was him that pulled the plug on the Beatles. Yoko was not the reason. So it will be interesting to see if Peter includes the famous exchange between Billy and George, where Billy is instructing George on how to play guitar and George becomes agitated with him and a terse exchange ensues. Or the scene of Billy talking to John about playing live gigs and Lennon having this bored look on his face. Or completely ignore John Lennon's song, How Do You Sleep? Which was released on September 9th, 1971, Billy's birthday, a song that was released only one year after Let It Be came out, where John rips into Billy and during one documented rehearsal of the song calls Billy a c Based on the press releases I have read so far, this film appears to be an attempt to rewrite history by putting a happy face on a period of Beatle history that was clearly in decline and make a ton of money in the process, as the gullible masses will undoubtedly line up to drink the Kool-Aid. So that's my two cents. Now let's take a look at a perspective that came to me from someone who understands the filmmaking business. This person reached out to me unsolicited to offer their insights. And so here's what they had to say about the trailer that Peter Jackson put out on his Let It Be film. And the link to Jackson's clip is in the description box below. Quote, After watching the little clip, my first question is, how is there 56 hours of unseen footage? The term before unseen should raise a red flag. Who has never taken the time to look at these film reels in 50 years? Then there is image quality. This looks like Martin 720p or 1080p HD or even 4K video with a 16mm effect sauce. Definitely not 16mm stock. The press info reads, it has been shot in 16mm, blown up to 35mm and restored. Yes. But 400 ISO film resolution noise cannot be deleted by simply blowing up to 35 millimeter. Lost shadow detail by lack of light cannot be dialed back in by restoring. If the emulsion doesn't contain the information, it is simply not there. They brought back contrast like impossible. There's a lot that can be done nowadays in bringing back completely out of focus images into super sharp images. Post-edit color balancing, shifting or replacement, image stabilizing, green screen effects, all is possible. There's a whole lot that modern day computer render farms can do, especially by someone with the clout of Peter Jackson. I am most aware of what is possible with deep fake technology. I bet Jackson can bring back my deceased grandmother in 4K, 60 frames per second quality in super surround sound. When you look at this clip with a woke eye, it doesn't feel right. It feels like a Fast and the Furious production of The French Connection. It is not organic. Obviously, it isn't from one day of filming. It's all contrived and so very staged. This whole Jackson presentation is also contrived. And this person is referring to Jackson's promo clip. The link is below. 
It screams at the viewer, look, we are editing original Beatles material. He is trying too hard to convince us that this is not staged. Most people won't recognize manipulated imagery. This holds true in current times. End quote. So there you go. This coming from someone with expertise in filmmaking. Thank goodness for awake people. Now let's move to the next slide and try to answer the question as to why Billy is playing both sides of the coin, meaning disclosure versus the official narrative. I have been asked many times, when is Billy going to fully disclose and why is he going about disclosure in a very subliminal way? And why does he continue to push the mainstream narrative of the Beatles versus just coming clean? The rate and pace of his disclosure is governed by his legal obligations, which means he has restrictions as to how much he can openly reveal. If he strays outside the legal parameters, he runs the risk of breaching his contract and becoming entangled in lawsuits with the potential for significant financial impacts, since his financial structure is directly linked to his playing the role of Paul McCartney, a role that he is contractually obligated to play. In memoirs, Billy tells us that he will not risk damaging all he has built and he will not do anything that will hurt his family. But that being said, Billy has been disclosing in covert ways ever since he publicly emerged as Paul McCartney. For example, on Sgt. Pepper, his debut Beatles album, we are introduced to Billy Shears along with a ton of Paul is Dead clues in both the song lyrics and the Sgt. Pepper album cover. This is something he has been doing ever since. And as I have shown in this presentation, McCartney 3 is no exception. Over the years, we have many interviews and video clips where he masterfully speaks and tells us he is not Paul McCartney. So apparently, he is permitted to disclose as long as it is masterfully done. Masterful speaking is a technique used by Freemasons, which allows them to speak the truth as long as their words are encoded or disguised within their presentation. For those that are aware of the technique, they will receive the truth. For those that are unaware, they will continue to be deceived and embrace the illusion. As I've mentioned in a number of videos, Billy views memoirs as a book which offers the intrepid the opportunity to get a glimpse inside the pyramid of power in order to gain a better understanding of how the world truly operates. In a way, Memoirs is very similar to the message in The Wizard of Oz, where we are given the opportunity to pull back the curtain and take a look inside the control room. He is also very aware that only a very small percentage of the masses are ready and motivated to engage and pursue this level of awakening. The overwhelming majority of the population is completely immersed in the illusionary world, a world that has been fabricated for them to keep them preoccupied with things that in the end are not very meaningful. Why Billy is motivated to reveal hidden knowledge is a good question, and it's a question that only he can really answer. But since I get asked this question many times, I will offer my opinion. When someone does not live their true life, in other words, they forsake their true identity to become someone else, there is always going to be that part of the soul, or even the ego, that wants to break out and say, hey, this is who I really am. It's similar to the actor who becomes typecast. For example, the public saw Leonard Nimoy as Spock, even though Leonard Nimoy played other roles and had talents outside of the movies and television. But he could not escape being identified as Spock. Well, I would say Billy has a similar situation. Think about all the songs he has written for the Beatles, as a Beatle, and for 50 years after the Beatles, and everyone believes those songs were written by Paul McCartney, a person that passed away over five decades ago. So I believe there is this nagging feeling inside of him, especially now that he is reaching the end of his life, where he wants the world to know, even if the message is encoded, that it was William Shepard who created the lion's share of the McCartney portfolio and not Paul McCartney. In other words, he is looking for the credit he believes he has earned and which, in his mind, is long overdue. Now, I'm not saying I agree with this or that Billy deserves anything. My personal take is he made choices, and with choices 
There are consequences, both good and bad. That's life. The other aspect to this has to do with how high-level Masons and secret societies view knowledge and intellect. There is the possibility that Billy is engaged in a process of initiation involving those that are awake and receptive to what Manly P. Hall refers to as the secret teachings of the ages. This awakening process is considered enlightenment or illumination by the cultic elite and therefore is designed to lift the awakened individual up and out of the sea of unknowing. Now let's take a moment and briefly discuss Billy's Luciferian philosophy. But before I start, I would like to note that as I researched Luciferianism, I had an exchange with a knowledgeable source that explained to me that many Luciferians will state the Lucifer they worship is not the Lucifer defined by the Christian belief system. In general terms, Luciferian philosophy teaches that one must balance the spiritual and material aspects of their existence here in the physical world. They might also argue that Satanism is a corrupted version of Luciferianism in that Satanists focus almost exclusively on their physical desires and very little on their spiritual aspects. In fact, there are Luciferians that will reject the notion that Luciferianism and Satanism are interchangeable. Luciferians hold the belief that one should pursue their innermost desires or pure will, and there is nothing wrong with accumulating wealth and fame as long as it is balanced with spiritual disciplines. Luciferians also believe it is fair game to leverage the unknowing of others to obtain what the Luciferian desires in pursuit of their will. In other words, what another person is ignorant of or does not know is not their problem. If a person is unknowing and wishes not to be outwitted or outmaneuvered, then they should seek knowledge. Simply put, a Luciferian places the responsibility of obtaining knowledge on the individual. We see this philosophy play out all the time in environments like the corporate world. Luciferians also believe in harnessing the energy and focus of the collective to manifest their physical world desires. And to a Luciferian, energy is energy. For example, people who research Paul is dead and claim to despise Billy and then post, write, and rant about him in a negative light are unwittingly focused on him and thus directing their energy toward him in the form of thought and consciousness which he then manipulates to his benefit. Luciferians look to manifest an external world that mirrors their internal will, while most people do the exact opposite where the external world becomes their internal mindset. Luciferians will argue this is the reason why most people lead sub-optimized and unfulfilled lives. Now, I'm not saying I agree or disagree with the tenets I just explained. All I'm doing is presenting what I have learned by researching the Luciferian ideology in order to gain a better understanding of those that control this realm. Since the Beatles are a monstrous cash cow for Billy, and Billy seeks to optimize his physical world ambitions, he will continue to push the fictional mainstream Beatle narrative because he benefits significantly from it. It goes back to taking advantage of the unknowing, which is represented by the 99% on the chart. Now, for those that are awake to the fiction, there is this initial energy that comes Billy's way because people are researching and investigating the conspiracy, like me or possibly you. But over time, the benefits to Billy decline as people who learn the truth begin to spend less of their energy focused on the Beatles and on Billy. For example, I have cleared out much of my Beatle collectibles, and even though I still appreciate the craftsmanship and production of the music, I spend very little time listening to Beatle music these days because for me, the luster is gone. There was a time when I would be anticipating the release of the new Let It Be film by Peter Jackson, but today, I can care less. The worship is gone. Many people have written me and expressed the exact same feelings. Even books on the Paul is Dead topic are not lucrative endeavors because it is a niche topic. What makes it niche is the fact that the overwhelming majority of the masses are unwavering in their worship and immersed in the illusion. So from a purely financial perspective, Billy's time and energy is better spent promoting the mainstream Beatle narrative 
since it has an overwhelmingly better return on investment, and it's an area where he can harness far more of the collective consciousness that is maniacally focused on him. So I would argue that his disclosure process, as underground as it is, contributes to the balancing between the spiritual and material aspects of his life in the physical realm. In other words, his physical gain comes from the official narrative, and his spiritual offset is disclosure. Some might think of it as a form of balancing karma. Spiritual or universal laws dictate that truth is an imperative, and a Luciferian, if I understand their tenets correctly, must balance those scales. And that concludes the presentation. But before heading out, I will leave you with an excerpt from David Lynch where he offers his insights on consciousness. And then I'll play an interesting clip from the movie Under the Silver Lake. As you listen and watch, look for a particular iconic instrument. It's a great truth drop. And then we will close with the song Ghost Rider from the band Famous Groupies, whose new release, the Furry White album, is filled with a splendid collection of wing-sounding music. And I do believe Kirkaldi and Friends are telling us a little something. The link to their website and music is in the description box below. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much. It's good to be here in Boston, and thank you very much for coming here tonight. Hi. Hi. Yeah, I teach film. I make films. Um, I would like to know, I'm not a meditator. What does meditation, can you say anything about how meditation might connects to your creative process or to the, might help the creative process of my students or myself? Yes, I can. Will you? Uh, yes, I will. <laughs> uh, tonight's talk is consciousness, creativity, and the brain. And um, if you have a golf ball-sized consciousness, when you read a book, you'll have a golf ball-sized understanding. When you look out, a golf ball size awareness, and when you wake up in the morning, a golf ball size wakefulness. But if you could expand that consciousness, then you read the book, more understanding. You look out, more awareness, and when you wake up, more wakefulness. It's consciousness. And there's an ocean of pure, vibrant consciousness inside each one of us. And it's right at the source and base of mind, right at the source of thought, and it's also at the source of all matter. So what does it all mean? Come and sit down. Yeah. That Kurt Cobain's Fender Mustang guitar? Oh, I don't know. Probably. I don't remember. I have so many things. Can I pick it up? I don't know. I don't always worry what the message is. I just pass it along. I slip it between the notes, hide it away from people that know it's there. You're saying you've done this before? Codes? I wrote the music your dad grew up to. Half of what you sang along to as a kid, and I'm still doing it. And these teenagers are dancing to my music. I want it that way. Tell me why. You're telling me there's hidden messages in old pop songs? Now, movies and television shows. Everything you know. Why? That's pop culture, isn't it? Floats away like tissue paper. Yeah, I blow my nose. I find a used Kleenex, I recycle it. And there is your wedding song. Here it comes. I want to know what love is. <laughs> And I want you to show me. What are the tunnels for? Is there going to be a war? Oh, hell, I don't know. I'm just trying to make a living, earn a few dollars. 
But you have everything. No. You know this girl? Well, isn't she pretty? Earth Angel. Earth Angel. She was killed. Well, won't you be mine? Well, Along with Jefferson Sevens, but I think you already knew that. Huh? No, I did not. I don't care what's fashionable or cool. It's all silly and it's all meaningless. I created so many of the things that you care about. The songs that give your life purpose and joy. When you were 15 and rebelling, you were rebelling to my music. Uh-oh. That's what you know. <laughs> that song was not written on distorted guitar. No. I wrote it here on piano somewhere between a blowjob and an omelet. There is no rebellion. There's only me earning a paycheck. I don't believe you. Well, good, because the real message was not meant for you. So it's better if you just smile and you dance and you enjoy the melody. Because this ugly old man, me, I am the voice of your generation, your grandparents, your parents, and all the young people that follow you. I love rock and roll. Drop another dime in the jukebox, baby. <laughs> oh, look at you. <laughs> Everything that you hoped for, that you dreamed about being a part of, is a fabrication. Your art, your writing, your culture is the shell of other men's ambitions, ambitions beyond what you will ever understand. <laughs> That's funny to you? Well, it's a little bit funny, don't you think? <laughs> because I wrote this, and I wrote this, <laughs> and I wrote this, Stop it. And I wrote this too. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> Who's paying you to write these songs? <laughs> <laughs> Who's paying you to write these songs?
Hey friends, it's Mike. I have some interesting Billy news to take you through, where William's connection into the memoirs of Billy Shears is becoming increasingly obvious. The intertwining of Billy's work as Paul McCartney with memoirs is becoming more and more tightly linked, as I will show you in a moment. Memoirs is classified as historical fiction, but as I have explained in many presentations and interviews, the book is also encoded with the truth. And once you decode memoirs, the book reveals the truth not only about the replacement of biological Paul McCartney, but the Beatles as well. When the first edition of Memoirs came out in 2009, this was the version with the red cover, it was a bit cryptic and not nearly as straightforward as the second edition, the blue-covered version, which came out in 2018 and contained a plethora of footnotes which were very revealing. And when the second edition of Billy's Back came out, which is the abridged version of Memoirs, but still weighing in at 400 pages, Tom included additional footnotes which revealed even more about the Beatles myth, especially as to the authorship of the music. The updated version of Billy's Back came out after I released my four and a half hour presentation, Did the Beatles Write All the Wrong Music? The footnotes in the blue covered version of Billy's Back confirm the conclusion I reached from my research, which is the Beatles did not write all their own music nor did they play on their records, especially between the period of 1962 through 1966. During this time, the lads' studio work consisted of recording the vocals for the songs only, not the music. And then, starting with Billy's Sgt. Pepper album, we begin to hear more of their own compositions, as well as John, George, and Ringo playing on the recorded tracks, although... I believe outside songwriters and studio musicians were still being used through 1969, which would include Abbey Road and Let It Be. To record the instrumental tracks on the early albums, starting with Please Please Me Through Revolver, George Martin employed studio musicians. This approach, which I refer to as the Wrecking Crew model, was the process used by the music industry throughout the 1960s and 1970s. The Wrecking Crew would record the music and then the artist would come in to lay down the vocal tracks. A great example of this is the Beach Boys and their album Pet Sounds. The Beach Boys did not play on that record. They came in to do the vocals after the instrumental tracks were recorded by the studio musicians. You can watch the Wrecking Crew documentary for free on YouTube. For those who have not watched my presentation, Did the Beatles Write All Their Own Music? I will leave a link in the description box below. My video, which was released a year ago on April 1st, 2020, and currently has over 130,000 views worldwide, and that number is probably closer to 150,000 when I take into account YouTube stripping out views, which I caught them doing a number of times. This is why I have uploaded the presentation to my other platforms as well. As a side note, the video was running for six months with no copyright issues until Universal Music Group, who initially had no problem with me including a portion of Lennon's song God in the presentation, then turned around again after six months and decided to submit a copyright claim on the song, which shut the video down worldwide until I was able to replace the track with a copyright-free song, which I did after a few days. I will argue this type of interference doesn't happen unless you venture too close to the truth. Now, the majority of this presentation is going to focus on the combined packaging of Billy's new book titled The Lyrics, which covers the period from 1956 to the present with the memoirs of Billy Shears. And the website we're going to look at that brings Billy's two worlds together is www.memoirsofpaul.com. And I'm assuming Tom was involved in setting the website up. I do have an email into Tom asking for his input. If he responds after this video is completed, I will include his response in the description box below. But before we get into decoding some of the information on the website, I want to cover a post involving Gregory Paul Martin, who is credited with the foreword in the current edition of Memoirs, and who also did the narration for the audio version of the book. The post I'm going to show you goes back around six months ago. I was made aware of it soon after Gregory posted, but I decided at the time to wait before discussing it. I was asked back then what I thought was going on, so I'll take the time now to give you my thoughts and opinion. Now, as many of you know, Gregory Paul Martin is the eldest son of George Martin, and he wrote, or at the very least, approved the foreword, which kicks off the second edition of Memoirs, or the blue-covered version of the book. 
So let's take a moment to read that forward. When Thomas E. U. Harriet first approached me about narrating this book, I was curious. I had no idea such a strong belief was still prevalent in the Beatles subculture that the rumor about Paul's death all those years ago was true. Exploring the possibility in the form of a novel seemed an intelligent way to address the subject, and the extent of Hugh Harriet's knowledge of the subject interested me. As a gifted actor, I have a natural facility for mimicry. My version of Paul McCartney's voice came easily to me, especially since I have known him since I was five years old. I first met Paul in the winter of 1962, just a few months after my father, Sir George Martin, signed the Beatles to Parlophone Records. To record the memoirs, I thought it would be most fitting to use the original recording equipment that the Beatles had used at Abbey Road Studios with the help from my father and from engineers Jeff Emmerich and Dave Harries. That equipment is now located at the prestigious British Grove Studios. On several occasions during the recording process, while sitting at the same equipment to record this book that the Beatles and my father had used for their vast catalog of songs, I felt I had become Paul. While this experience is a natural part of an actor's process, in this instance, with this subject matter, it felt uncanny. Is Paul dead? I leave that to you to decide. Meanwhile, in Paul's words, let me introduce to you the one and only Billy Shears. And that's the foreword by Gregory Paul Martin in the second edition of The Memoirs of Billy Shears. And here's a brief clip of Gregory doing the narration or voiceover for the book. Stuart was the first martyr. Assuming Paul's identity, dreaming of him and feeling his presence, each reinforces the others. I stand for him and he for me. Part of each of us is in the other. Although I may say he died and I live, it is not entirely true. My own life as William was halted with Paul McCartney's fatal crash, yet he continued on through me. You might as well say Bill died and Paul lives. I'm not an impersonator in ordinary terms. Our exchange is mutual. Paul's spiritless remains mark the end of William's life now to the extent that my living flesh embodies Paul's life. I am Paul. I am Billy. I have died. That is why I live as I do. Dreaming of him as myself, I dream particularly of that part of me that I miss growing up. It helps me understand who I am. Even before I left my life, Back last year, I believe it was September of 2020, Gregory put a post up on his Facebook page, which I will show in a moment, where he is looking to distance himself from the work he did recording the audiobook. Now, I do know the person that triggered his response because this person wrote to me and explained what happened. I also want to make it clear I had no involvement in any of this and I was unaware of the exchange until the email came in. When I used to be on Facebook, I did not belong to any Paul is Dead or Beatles group other than a private group I used to run which I archived a year ago. I just don't find these groups and forums very interesting. And I wasn't even aware that Gregory had a Facebook page. So the way this came about, as it was explained to me, is Gregory put some posts up about McCartney and was referring to him as Paul and then the person commented, you mean Billy, right? And then added, didn't you narrate the memoirs audiobook? Now I can see where this can be considered trolling, but I know this person and they are not mean-spirited and if I had to guess, they were having some fun by poking a little. And the fact is, Gregory did narrate the audiobook and he is credited with the foreword in memoirs. There is a certain level of interaction that goes with the territory when you engage a controversial topic as Gregory did when he approved the foreword and did the narration for the audiobook. I think his categorization of the person's comments being quote-unquote abusive is a little over the top, but then again, how people feel is subjective. What I can say is if you want to understand abusive comments, you should read what I get periodically from the haters. You would not believe how vile some people can truly be. Of course, Gregory's response made the rounds, and I was asked if I thought Gregory actually believes Billy is biological Paul. And my answer is, no, I do not. In my opinion, I find that premise hard to believe. So with that backdrop, let me read Gregory's post, which was forwarded to me, and then I will share my thoughts. I am knocking this Billy Shears BS on the head once and for all. Tonight, 
I got a disrespectful, abusive message from one of those dingbats dumb enough to believe the insane Paul is dead urban myth that Paul McCartney died before Sgt. Pepper and was replaced in the Beatles by some fictitious character named Billy Shears and that the Big Mac attack we know and love today has been an imposter for over 53 years. This fresh lunacy is 100% caca. I spoke about it during the Q&A at the end of last Sunday's webinar on the astrology of the Beatles. I now realize that was not enough. To repeat, the reason I agreed to narrate you Harriet's bizarre memoirs of Billy Shears was that I was having a blast impersonating Macca on the internet when he reached out to me offering me a very decent fee to narrate his book. I enjoy narration and obviously know the subject like the back of my hand. I had no clue until I was half into the 18 hours of recording how loony the book was. By that time, I was knee-deep into the project with a contract between us we had both signed. What else was I going to do except finish the daft job? I particularly regret setting up sessions for myself to record the text at Mark Knopfler's British Grove Studios in London. The manager is an old colleague of my father's. When he realized the preposterous nature of the book I was recording, he looked at me like I had a screw loose, like I was a wingnut who had just got out of the loony bin. And I don't blame him. Case closed. Now, we obviously have two diametrically opposing positions from Gregory. I personally find it very hard to believe that he did not know the full extent of what he signed up for when he agreed to narrate the book. Memoirs is still an underground book, meaning it is clearly not a mainstream read. So we have to ask ourselves, how is it that Tom, who is the author slash encoder of a book which has limited mass exposure, since no book on the Paul is Dead topic is on any bestseller list, how is it that Tom was able to, one, connect with Gregory, who was a celebrity, and two, negotiate a deal to have Gregory narrate memoirs? This would be like me trying to contact him to come on my show and do an interview about his experiences regarding the Beatles and his father. The odds of that happening are extremely low. I might receive a polite form letter telling me no thanks, but getting as far as signing a contract is a pretty impressive play on Tom's part. And attorneys must have been involved to make sure the I's were dotted and the T's were crossed, especially as it pertains to protecting the interests of Gregory. So what I'm saying is there had to be a discovery and negotiation process that took place before closing on the deal. It's hard to imagine he would not have known the specifics of what the book was about including the details of the content, which would include the darker chapters contained within memoirs. Chapters with titles like Masonic Checkmate, Stone to Hell, More Satanic Murders, and Paulism beg for explanation. If it were me, I would have asked, okay, is there something in these chapters I need to know about? And to say, it wasn't until 18 hours into the recording that he figured out what the book was about seems to be a bit of a stretch but that's just me. So the question I asked myself was, is there more to this story regarding the about face? On one hand, Gregory presents a glowing forward for the book as well as agreeing to do the audiobook narration, and then he's distancing himself with the Facebook post. If I go at this from my own experiences on this topic, I can tell you that this research is highly controversial and can be extremely toxic. The level of hate that comes your way if you discuss or present the Beatles in a way that conflicts with the official narrative is beyond most people's comprehension. It gets very ugly very fast. The Beatles are a religion to millions upon millions of people. I get attacked by people within the Paul is Dead community because I dare to present a narrative that does not align and conflicts with the beliefs and dogma of ideologues. So if this kind of toxic behavior plays out within the Paul is Dead community, Imagine a reaction from people who have no clue about the conspiracy and then find out George Martin's son wrote or approved the foreword of a book that unravels the Beatles' official story. And to top it off, he also did the voiceover for the audiobook. So perhaps Gregory experienced unanticipated blowback and it started to get uncomfortable. In other words, he found himself in a position where he was confronted with questions about his role in memoirs, a book that questions the very core of so many people's belief that the Beatles were gods. And of course, an argument can be made that he should have expected at least some level of negative press, but trust me, 
having been in this space for five years now, when you first get into this topic, there's no way of knowing the magnitude of the vitriol that ensues. Being thought of as a Paul is Dead conspiracy theorist doesn't help in the public relations department, especially when your father is George Martin, who is often referred to as the fifth Beatle. And again, these are just my thoughts on possibilities. I could be completely wrong, and maybe there are very different reasons for what happened. For example, maybe this is all part of the Masonic concept of duality and opposing forces, as in, you say yes, I say no, you say stop, and I say go. Or maybe it's as simple as controversy sells books. And with that, I'll leave it there and let you decide. Okay, so let's move on now and take a closer look at the website, The Memoirs of Paul McCartney. Here's the homepage of The Memoirs of Paul McCartney. At first glance, it's straightforward and nothing flashy. But there is a ton of symbolism being shown, starting with the white print on the black background representing duality and the green and red color coding of the box sets, which I will explain in an upcoming slide. And there is, of course, numerology associated with the titles of the books. Let's read what the homepage has to say. I highlighted some of the wording, which I will get into in the next few slides. As I read, you should see that Billy is bringing both of his worlds together as he continues his disclosure process. The lyrics, 1956 to the present, and the memoirs of Billy Shears, reveal the pop icon from his own points of view, using mostly the same songs, but with their own focus. The lyrics, as put together by the gifted poet Paul Muldoon, presents the updated official story. The memoirs of Billy Shears, as put together by the gifted poet and coder Thomas E. U. Harriet, offers the hidden and coded esoteric meaning. Together, as if one originated in Sir Paul's left brain and the other originated in his right brain, we discover shocking double meanings. You can now order these memoirs as box sets. The lyrics 1956 to the present will be released on November 2nd, 2021. The Memoirs of Billy Shears, which is already available on Amazon as a single volume, will be released as a special box set on October 12th, just 21 days ahead of the lyrics. That will give you three weeks to ingest the esoteric meanings of each song before returning to the traditional narrative. In the box sets, the 960 pages of the lyrics, 1956 to the present, are organized alphabetically by song title, A through K and then L through Z. Much of that reading consists of the lyrics themselves, followed by Sir Paul's recollections. In the memoirs of Billy Shears, the 666 pages are divided with 33 chapters in each volume. The wording is important to focus on. Note the mainstream narrative about Billy is referred to as the official narrative and the traditional narrative. Why even use this wording unless there is another narrative at play? And we are clued in that the other narrative is esoteric, meaning there is a hidden story that will emerge upon studying both books. Now, before we continue with the box sets, let's understand a little about who Paul Muldoon is. The first thing we should know is his name in Pythagorean numerology reduces to nine, and the number of letters in Paul Muldoon equals 11. Coincidence? I don't think so, but you can decide for yourself. Muldoon is a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the American Academy of Arts and Letters. He has received many awards for his work, and he is the recipient of honorary doctorates from 10 universities. So clearly, Mr. Muldoon is highly credentialed and in the club. Billy picks and chooses his team with great care just as he did by selecting Tom to head up the Memoirs Project and having Peter Jackson head up the new version of the Let It Be movie, which is now titled The Beatles Get Back and will be released on August 27th, 2021. Okay, so let's move back to the homepage and look at the numbers. As we can see by looking at the slide, the homepage is chock full of occult numbers. And as a point of reference, I am using Pythagorean numerology where applicable. The title of the book, The Memoirs of Billy Shears, equals six. The last name of McCartney contains nine letters. The title, The Lyrics, reduces to the number 11, which is a master number. The last two digits of 1956, or five plus six, also sums to 11. And please note, 
Sometimes all four digits of a year are in the calculation, and other times it's the last two digits that are used. You will see it both ways, and it's very common. The Lyrics box set is scheduled to release on November 2nd, 2021, which equals 1 plus 1 plus 2 plus 2 plus 0 plus 2 plus 1, summing to 9, as does the release date for the Memoirs box set on October 12th, 2021, which equals 1 plus 0 plus 1 plus 2 plus 2 plus 0 plus 2 plus 1, equaling 9. Memoirs will be released 21 days ahead of the lyrics. 2 plus 1 equals 3, and this points back to Billy's last album, McCartney 3. And an interesting footnote, when we add the numbers of each side of a die, we get 21. I did an entire presentation on decoding McCartney 3. If you have not watched the video, the link is in the description box below. Another 3 is represented by the 66 chapters in Memoirs. When we add 6 plus 6, we get 12, and then 1 plus 2 equals 3. 21 days is also 3 weeks. There are 7 days in each week, representing triple sevens or 777. Triple seven is the sum of the paths of the lightning flash of creation which travels along the tree of life. In occult circles, 777 is the house of Horus. Triple seven also represents spiritual consciousness in a physical human being, while 666 represents spiritual entities incarnated as beasts of the earth. And as we know, Memoirs is 666 pages. And 6 plus 6 plus 6 equals 18, and 1 plus 8 equals 9. The box set, The Lyrics, contains 960 pages, which is 9 plus 6 plus 0, which equals 15, and 1 plus 5 equals 6. In Memoirs, Billy tells us when he is playing Paul McCartney, he's all about the 9s, and when he is William, or himself, he's about the 6s which points back to Saturn and his Luciferian belief system. The number 9 is associated with transformation and change, which of course comes before the number 10, which represents completion. And now, let's take a closer look at the lyrics box set. What appears to be simple artwork and presentation is actually loaded up with occult symbolism. Let's start with why Billy chose the color green for the cover. In masonry, the color green is symbolic of the unchanging immortality of all that is divine and true. Masonry received this conception from the ancient Egyptians, where green represents the immortality of the soul, which is known to be divine. We can also see the box set has two volumes, denoted as A through K and L through Z. In numerology, AK reduces to 3, and LZ to 11. When we multiply 3 times 11, we get 33 representing the 33 degrees of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. The books, side by side, denotes the number 11, as well as representing the two pillars of Freemasonry, Joachim and Boaz. The pillars represent the spiritual development of man. One Masonic legend averes that philosopher Pythagoras discovered the pillars and together with Hermes used them to discover all of the secrets of geometry. We then see Billy's face is split in half. This is showing us he is comprised of one half biological Paul and one half himself as William, and we'll talk more about this in an upcoming slide. As I mentioned earlier, the name McCartney contains nine letters, and the lyrics in Pythagorean numerology reduces to 11, and so we have 9-11 encoding as well as 11 itself since 9-11 or 9 plus 1 plus 1 reduces to 11, and I should also mention that Biopaul's full name, James Paul McCartney, in Pythagorean numerology, is also 11. The full title of the box set, Paul McCartney the Lyrics, has numerology of 10, and as I stated before, the number 10 is the number of completion. This clue tells me that Billy is getting closer to wrapping things up. Now let's analyze the Memoirs box set. As would be expected, the Memoirs box set is brimming with occult numbers and symbolism. Let's start with the cover. The red cover represents the color of fire, and fire to the Egyptians was the symbol of regeneration and the purification of souls. Hence, in the Masonic system, red is the symbol of regeneration. The title of the box set, The Memoirs of Billy Shears, has numerology of six. As with the lyrics box set, we again see the books side by side denoting the number 11, as well as the twin pillars of Freemasonry. 
and we see Billy's face is again divided in half. Volume 1 of the set contains 33 chapters, and the second book, the remaining 33 chapters, totaling to 66 chapters. 33 can also represent 3 plus 3, which equals 6, as well as 3 times 3, equaling 9. The 66 chapters can be viewed as 6 plus 6, or 12, which takes us back to 3, and the number of dots on the die on the cover of Billy's McCartney 3 album. The Memoirs box set is especially focused on the numbers 3, 6, and 9, which are considered to be powerful numbers in the creation and existence of the universe. Now let's shift back to the image on the home page and see if there are any more occult clues. The image on the home page shows Billy in the middle between the two box sets. As we now know, the box sets are representative of the twin pillars of Freemasonry, Joachim and Boaz. Billy being positioned in the center with one box set to his right and the other to his left is depicting enlightenment. Between the pillars is the path to illumination, but first, we must learn our lessons by walking the path of duality, which is represented by the checkerboard floor. Also, note how each pillar contains the red and green colors. With the Masonic symbolism that Billy constantly presents, he is telling us that his work with the Beatles, as well as his solo career, is in support of human enlightenment. Although this philosophy has been in place for a very long time, going back to the Egyptian mysteries, the modern era version emerged in the 1960s with the human potential movement, which became the Aquarian Conspiracy, and then morphed into the concepts of the New Age movement. I explain these movements in greater detail in my presentation, Did the Beatles Write All Their Own Music? The link is in the description box below. It's important to note that there is a subset of memoirs called Beatles Enlightenment. From Tom's website, BillyShears.com, we are told Beatles Enlightenment contains selections from the memoirs of Billy Shears that are too philosophical or spiritually esoteric for the general readership of Billy's back. If you enjoy books by illuminaries, such as Deepak Chopra, Wayne Dyer, Ram Dass, or Marianne Williamson, you will love reading some of their favorite concepts behind Beatles songs. Now, I'm not saying what Billy is involved in or what he supports or believes is good or bad. That is something that is up to each of us to decide. I'm simply presenting my research and interpretation of the meaning behind the symbolism. Symbolism he has been presenting for almost 60 years. Now let's take a look back 40 years and see if Billy was giving us similar clues. At first glance, Billy's McCartney 2 album from 1980 appears to be unassuming. However, as with all of his work, there is far more to see than meets the eye. To the left, I have the graphic from the previous slide as reference. To the right, we see Billy's McCartney 2 album cover, along with some additional images and callouts to explain what is going on. The album cover by itself shows Billy between two shadows. He is again telling us he is one part Paul and one part William. Therefore, in a sense, he is split in two, as depicted by each volume of the two box sets. The shadows also denote the twin pillars of masonry, with Billy in the center representing illumination. One pillar is Paul, and the other is Billy, with the character of Paul McCartney representing the path to enlightenment. This spiritual concept is referred to as Paulism in the memoirs of Billy Shears. Paulism is the concept where biological Paul is a graven Christ figure, who died and was resurrected through Billy. People who idolize the Beatles and Billy as Paul McCartney are unknowingly adherents to the religion of Paulism. To the occultists, harnessing human consciousness and energy to manifest a desired outcome does not require willing participation. It only requires your focus and attention. That focus and attention comes in the form of worshiping or idolizing the Beatles by playing their songs, going to concerts, watching documentaries, reading books, buying merchandise, and believing the official or traditional Beatles story, which is mostly fiction. Paulism is a Luciferian cult. And as a side note, if you consider yourself a Paul is Dead researcher or follower, but believe the Beatles started organically and were prolific songwriting geniuses before being commandeered by evil forces, you are unwittingly in the church of Paulism as well as a result of continued worship, idolizing, or believing in, at least in part, to the official Beatles story. Now, going back to the image on the right, 
we again see the nine letters of McCartney along with the Roman numeral for two. However, two also represents the master number of 11. One plus one equals two. And the Roman numeral is also symbolic of the zodiac sign of Gemini. Gemini represents the twins, and thus, we are back to the two shadows on the album cover, which, when combined, represents Billy's character of Paul McCartney. I should also note that Bio Paul was born on June 18, 1942, and he was a Gemini. Last but not least, the release date of McCartney 2 was May 16, 1980, which reduces to 3, which, of course, can be representative of 6, 9, 21, and 777. Now let's swing back to the website and take a look at the other tabs for possible clues. Okay, so the next tab over from the home page is titled The Lyrics. And again, the website is memoirsofpaul.com, and I will leave a link in the description box below. So let's take a look at what the website says and see if we can pick up on any clues. The lyrics, created with the talents of the poet Paul Muldoon, is the official memoirs of Paul McCartney. It presents 154 songs traditionally credited to Paul McCartney with the Beatles, Wings, and through the long solo McCartney career. The lyrics 1956 to the present is the standard memoirs of Paul McCartney, which naturally excludes the forbidden information. So the first thing that caught my attention is the number 154, which reduces down to the number 10, which is the number of completion. And if I had a guess... What this is representing is that Billy is wrapping things up. The other wording that caught my attention is 154 songs traditionally credited to Paul McCartney. It doesn't say 154 songs written by Paul McCartney. And that's a big distinction, folks. Okay, so let's move down. These 154 songs, arranged alphabetically, are presented as if all were written by the same individual. Spanning two volumes, these commentaries give Sir Paul's ideas of how the songs were written, including some details of Paul's life and some discussion about the individuals who inspired some of those songs. So this one is just filled with clues. The 154 songs arranged alphabetically are presented as if all were written by the same individual. And what this is telling us is they were not written by the same individual. And then this paragraph goes on to say, these commentaries give Sir Paul's ideas of how the songs were written. Well, why are they his ideas? If Paul McCartney wrote these songs, then he should know exactly how these songs were written. Next paragraph. Sharing such ideas, ranging from the historical to the whimsical, strengthens and expands the traditional conservative narrative of how these songs came to be. While discussing some of his literary influences, such as William Shakespeare and Lewis Carroll, he gives details that are not in the memoirs of Billy Shears when referring to the same individuals. And again, we see this very odd wording, traditional conservative narrative, which alludes to the fact that the narrative is neither traditional nor conservative. Handwritten texts, paintings, and carefully selected photographs from McCartney's personal archives further instill the idea of continuity from the early Paul to Sir Paul today. However cropped, morphed or otherwise modified to create a seamless transition from the original Paul to the present knighted gentleman in that position, these artifacts are the new standard for the official narrative. So, again, we have some very, very interesting wording here. So, we're being told that we have carefully selected photographs from McCartney's personal archives that will further instill the idea of continuity from the early Paul to Sir Paul today. And what this is telling me is that there is a break in continuity, meaning we have biological Paul and we have Billy. And then the paragraph goes on to tell us that 
photographs and images have been cropped, morphed, and modified. This is something that I have been telling my audience from the very beginning, that they have been doctoring photographs and images from the start. And then it tells us this was done to create a seamless transition from the original Paul to the present knighted gentleman in that position. It can't be any more clear than that, folks. The original Paul to the present knighted gentleman in that position. The lyrics spanning 64 years, 6 plus 4 is 10, so we have the number of completion again, shall be Paul's definitive literary and visual record. It is the new authority on what current and future generations are to believe about Paul McCartney. With the help of these official memoirs of Paul McCartney, the charming lad from Liverpool will be long remembered as one of the greatest songwriters of all time. And if we take a look at the right side of the website, we have some images. Of course, here's the box set of the lyrics. But then we have this image of the lads. This appears to be a hybrid Paul McCartney. You can take a look at the chin, how it is elongated, as well as the entire picture being enhanced. We also have a version of John Lennon without the pinched pointy nose. The next image is one that I believe I put up on my community tab on my Paul is Dead channel. And we can see that we have the exact same backdrop and we have the exact same suits, ties, fingers. The only thing different is the heads. <laughs> so here's biological Paul and here is Billy. So that obviously was done to point out that there are two people at least two people playing the role. What I've always noticed about this image is the shininess of Billy's face, and it is Billy. You can take a look at the nose. That's his nose. And I believe the smoothness and the shininess is because of latex. That's been my take on that image. And down below we have another picture of the lads, and this does appear to be biological Paul. One of the facial features that distinguishes biological Paul from Billy is the ears. Paul had attached earlobes and his ears stuck out and Billy's ears are unattached and his ears sit closer to his head. Okay, so with that, let's move to the next tab now, which is titled Billy Shears. Okay, so this tab starts with the memoirs of Billy Shears is the tell-all memoirs of Paul McCartney. It was created with the talents of poet and coder Thomas E.U. Harriet and has a forward by Gregory Paul Martin, the son of fifth Beatle George Martin. So this is interesting because earlier in the presentation, I took you through the controversy involving Gregory. And here we have the website openly promoting the fact that Gregory wrote the forward to the memoirs of Billy Shears. The website goes on to say, the Memoirs of Billy Shears is packed with historically significant disclosure about the Beatles and about the elites who placed the band on the world stage to launch their global agendas. Many of these historical facts had been hidden from the 60s until this book. Crafted with poetic brilliance while conveying the historical message from Sir Paul's point of view, the book utilizes multiple methods, all with layered meaning, that pulls you in deeper with each reading. With all that going on, and with the book being the first to have word stacking and acrostical messages on every page of the narrative, it can be overwhelming. These memoirs of Paul McCartney are far less conservative than the traditional story. The memoirs of Billy Shears is more creative, historically detailed, and shockingly revealing. It is much too much to take in all at once. The memoirs has a built in sequel. On your first readings, we highly recommend that you ignore all of the above distractions and just focus on the story and song meanings, especially on the meanings that are not permitted in the official memoirs. That's going back to the lyrics. We especially urge you to ignore the acrostical code, word stacking, and footnotes on your first time through. After you have a good handle on the entire narrative, read it again with the word stacking and the acrostic. Finally, but not before your third reading, include the footnotes. 
That intended reading method changes the book so dramatically, taking you down many rabbit holes that eventually all connect. You really will feel as if you are reading a sequel. The book transforms itself as it initiates the reader. So there's a lot of information here, much of which I have been presenting and breaking down over the last, well, it's almost five years now. But we do get a very interesting phrase here. On your first readings, we highly recommend that you ignore all of the above distractions. We. Who's we? If it were just Tom, he would say, on your first readings, I highly recommend that you ignore all of the above distractions. Okay. And again, we have some images on the right-hand side, making some comparisons. And these are very, very obvious. And here Tom is showing some of the encoding. So here's the word stacking. I want you to know me. Paul McCartney is not who I am. Paul died in 1966. I am William. Now you can call me Billy Shears. The acrostic is a vertical code. And there is a separate book that just calls out the acrostic code. So you don't have to sit there with a pencil and a piece of paper and write it all out. Okay, so let's go to the last tab now. And that's titled Free Audio. And it starts by saying, Honoring the legacy of fifth Beatle Sir George Martin, his son Gregory Paul Martin recorded the unofficial tell-all memoirs of Paul McCartney, the memoirs of Billy Shears. To record this historically significant book, Gregory used the recording equipment that his father, George Martin, had used with the Beatles at Abbey Road Studios. That equipment is now located at the prestigious British Grove Studios. While recording the memoirs, sitting at that original equipment that the Beatles had used to record their vast catalog of songs, Gregory felt on several occasions that he himself had actually become Paul. It felt as though Paul were telling the whole story through him. Considering the subject matter, Gregory said that it felt uncanny. So again, this is very interesting, right? Going back to the, the controversy and Gregory distancing himself from the book with the Facebook post. And here we have a tab which is promoting his participation. So maybe what I said earlier that controversy sells books was exactly what was going on. Okay, so I'm going to conclude with my final thoughts. It should be very obvious now to anyone with a clear and open mind that Billy is continuing his disclosure process. As many of you know, I was a diehard Beatle fanatic, and then all of that changed when I read the original version of Memoirs and started to investigate the claims made in the book. And as time went on, and after decoding the layers within Memoirs, it became obvious to me the book was indeed telling the truth, both about the replacement of Paul McCartney and the true nature of what the Beatles really were, a band manufactured by Tavistock with the objective to social engineer our culture and society in order to usher in a one-world governance. More and more people are waking up to the realization that the Beatles, like the rest of reality, were and are a massive deception. The truth is, the lads were never organic and they were controlled from the very beginning. The notion of four working-class scousers from Liverpool, who were a bar and club band, and then discovered by a small record store owner, who got them signed to a major recording contract with EMI, under the tutelage of George Martin, which then led to unprecedented fame and fortune, is fiction. It's a Cinderella story that people love to believe in, but it's simply not true. There was no organic, and they did not write all their own music. As I undertook this journey, I was fascinated by the lines drawn within the Paul is Dead circles, where it's encouraged to examine and discuss the replacement of biological Paul while trashing Billy, but questioning the Beatle narrative prior to Billy's arrival is off-limits. That piece of the story must stay together. I always found this odd, and it actually begs you to look deeper into this part of Beatle history. Several months back, I was sent an email with a post from a Paul is Dead Facebook group 
accusing me of inflicting unimaginable damage to Biopol's legacy. I had to chuckle. Another person trapped in the illusion and an unknowing adherent to the cult of Paulism. My take is, the truth is the truth, and an honest researcher follows the clues. Otherwise, one becomes a partisan ideologue with dogmatic beliefs, or worse, an agenda. The Beatles' psychological operation is far more than the replacement of biological Paul. It is a tale of how the pyramid of power operates, and memoirs, if nothing else, pulls the curtain back, allowing us to get a glimpse of the great Oz. As I look back over the past five years, I feel very good about what I have presented to my audience, and I do believe, in the end, when the smoke settles, history will prove me far more right than wrong when full disclosure finally emerges. And last but not least, I want to reiterate that I have no affinity to either Biopaul or Billy. In fact, all of the luster that I used to see around the Beatles is gone. Yes, I can still appreciate the talents of the songwriting, regardless of who actually composed the songs, but the idolizing and worship is no longer a part of my life. And I have to say, it's very liberating. Knowing the truth is far better than living the lie. Thanks for listening. Hey friends, it's Mike. It is April 7th, 2021. And before I get started, if you are new to the McCartney and Beatles conspiracy and are lost as to what I'm presenting, there is a link in the description box below for a video I put together titled The Essentials of Paul is Dead. The video combines two of my presentations along with a roundtable discussion on the conspiracy. Watch that first along with my presentation on whether the Beatles wrote all their own music. That link is down below as well. The total watch time for both videos is around eight and a half hours, but I promise you, you will be up to speed once you take a look. Okay, and now on to business. This is a follow-up to my last video titled, The Memoirs of Paul McCartney, Disclosure Moves Forward. Tom did confirm he is managing the Memoirs of Paul McCartney website, which can be found at memoirsofpaul.com. And in the email exchange, I said, with the number 10 appearing, that it seems to me that Billy is wrapping things up, and Tom responded with, I agree with you that William is wrapping things up. From how I interpret page 13 of memoirs, I would expect to see more of that for the next two years. So Tom's response is pointing me to the date of February 21st, 2023. I have discussed this date before and explained that I thought it's possible the date represents when Billy is free of his obligations to play the role of Paul McCartney meaning he can retire and ride into the sunset. But now, maybe it means more than that, and it is actually signaling the day he departs this world. When I decoded McCartney 3, there were occulted clues which told me his runway is short. And then with the new website, The Memoirs of Paul McCartney, promoting both his new box set along with memoirs, basically combined marketing, we see the number 10 emerging again. The date of February 21st, 2023 does present some interesting numbers when I calculated the number of days between Billy's date of birth, which I believe to be September 9th, 1937, and February 21st, 2023. Now, I did an exercise like this in my Decoding McCartney 3 video based on what I saw as possible clues that Billy embedded with that album. So let's run that portion of the video again, and then we will look into page 13 of Memoirs and the date of February 21st, 2023. I also noticed the sky and cloud symbolism on the back cover is very similar to Lennon's Imagine album, which was released in 1971. Within nine years of releasing Imagine, John Lennon departed. This got me thinking, is the sky and cloud symbolism a clue as to how much time Billy has left in the physical world? Let's play with some numbers and see what we find. Imagine was released on October 11th, 1971. I should note that October 11th was the same day the Beatles began the Rubber Soul sessions. The date is important because it represents triple ones as well as the number three. Now set aside whether you believe Lennon actually died or not. From the standpoint of the occultist, a symbolic death and an actual death 
serve the same purpose as it depicts endings and subsequent rebirth. I should also point out that December 8, 1980, the day of Lenin's death, reduces to 9-11. We get this by taking December, or 12, which is 1 plus 2, and sums to 3, and then adding the 3 to the day, which is 8, and we get 11. And then, when we add the numbers in the year 1980, we get 18, or 1 plus 8, which totals to 9. So Lenin's death was an encoded 9-11 event. I began to wonder if the 3,347 days from the release of Imagine to Lenin's death could have any occult significance or hidden meaning. So I took a look. Thinking it might be possible that the sky and cloud imagery could be a countdown, I added 3,347 days to the release of McCartney 3, which takes us out to February 16, 2030, which is a little over nine years into the future. For those of us who keep a pulse on the controllers and their agenda, we know the year 2030 is a very important date to the elites with regard to their overall deliverables and as an Agenda 21 checkpoint. I then calculated the time between Billy's date of birth, which I have theorized is September 9, 1937, a date that also regroups to 9-11, and the date of February 16, 2030. And the result is intriguing. If we round the numbers, we get 33,000 days between Billy's date of birth and February 16, 2030. This time frame can also be calculated as 92 years or 1,109 months. Since rounding is very common when we discuss age, I found it interesting that the calculations resulted in the numbers 33, 11, and 911. Now, this is not a prediction. It's a what-if exercise I decided to run based on the sky and cloud symbolism on the back of Billy's album and the cover of Lennon's Imagine. I'm thinking there might be a correlation since nothing the controllers do is left to chance and everything they do is based in the occult. When folks have asked me my thoughts on when I think Billy might depart this world, I lean toward 90 because of his fixation on the number 9. But 92, which reduces to 11, works just as well. Okay, so that what-if scenario from my Decoding McCartney 3 presentation projects out to February 16th, 2030, and has Billy theoretically passing at 92 years of age. And of course, 9 plus 2 equals 11. But now let's read the first two paragraphs from page 13 of the second edition of Memoirs and see what it says. Almost everything about me taking Paul's place was made possible because of the series of dreams that Paul had, showing his death and me replacing him, and my own dreams of Paul showing me how. First, let me, William Shepard, or Billy Shears, tell you of a more recent dream. I want it told before I die, so that you will know I knew. After discussing my undertakings in his name, Paul said, You will be released on the 21st of February, 2014. I asked for a nine-year extension for more tours. Since I needed to see my Utah base in Coda one last time, a tour would include it. Until I am done, this book will be distributed on a level that will keep it down. We will keep it underground, until I am. Note in the last sentence, Tom wrote the word will with a capital W. Is this a nod to Crowley and do as thou wilt? Something to ponder. So the original date of when Billy was to be released, whatever released means, was February 21st, 2014. I thought release was when his commitment to play the part of Paul McCartney would end and he could retire. I was not leaning toward a date of when he would pass. By the way, if Billy had passed on February 21st, 2014, he would have been 76 years and 5 months. 7 plus 6 plus 5 equals 18, and 1 plus 8 equals 9. So it just continues to be very weird. I bolded out the two sentences where we get the date of February 21st, 2023. The original release date, per memoirs, was February 21st, 2014, and then he asked for a nine-year extension. And yes, he is telling us he is getting this information from the great beyond. I will leave it to each of you to decide whether you believe in communications with the other side. What is relevant 
is the nine-year extension he tells us he received, which takes us out to February 21st, 2023. And as I will show you, the numbers continue to roll along. But first, I want to call out the word stacking. These are the words bolded out in red and blue. It says, Everything was made possible because Paul had me, William Shepard. I knew Paul. I am that I am. What Billy is telling us is that Paul McCartney, as I explained in a number of my videos, is a graven Christ figure who died and was resurrected through Billy. This is the basis of the Luciferian cult of Paulism that is presented in memoirs. This is why Lenin said in an interview that by 2012, Paul will be Jesus. There are occultists and astrologers who believe the age of Aquarius began on December 21, 2012, and the Aquarian age represents the rise of the phoenix, or Lucifer. Billy is also telling us that he knew Paul. And in fact, in memoirs, Billy tells us he was introduced to Paul via Denny Lane in 1962. The phrase, I am that I am, is also interesting, because it is a reference back to the Bible and Moses and the story of the burning bush. When Moses asks Yahweh what he is to say to the Israelites when they ask why God sent him to them, Yahweh replies, I am who I am, adding, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. So is Billy telling us he's a god? It sounds a bit Crowley-esque if you ask me. Okay, so let's look at the numbers now having to do with the date of February 21st, 2023. When I calculate the number of days from Billy's date of birth, again, which I believe is September 9th, 1937, to February 21st, 2023, or the date with the extension, we get 31,212 days, which sums to 9. On February 21st, 2023, Billy will be 85 years and 5 months. 8 plus 5 plus 5 equals 18, and 1 plus 8 equals 9. When we add the numbers for the total seconds, minutes, hours, and weeks for this time period, we also get 9. How weird is that? I have often said that I was sure Billy's death would encapsulate the number 9. This is why when I was asked my thoughts on a possible age of death, I responded with 90 years old, which would take him out to 2027. But as we can see, February 21st, 2023 is chock full of 9s. Now let me show you the numerology around the key players associated with the Beatles. This was also very interesting. I decided to play around and calculate the Pythagorean numerology for some of the key players around the Beatles, and lo and behold, we are again presented with 3, 6, and 9, just like Billy's McCartney 3 album, memoirs, and so many other clues Billy and the Beatles have dropped. Remember, 3, 6, and 9 are considered higher dimensional energy influencing other numbers and powerful numbers in the creation and existence of the universe. So starting at the top left-hand side of the slide and then moving across, EMI reduces to 9, Abbey Road Studios to 9, George Martin to 6, Brian Epstein to 6, Neil Aspinall to 6, Norman Smith to 6, Alan Williams, their first manager, 6, and Jeff Emmerich reduces to 3. I also want to show you something I noticed after I uploaded my last video pertaining to the Gregory Paul Martin controversy with memoirs. An astute subscriber also left a comment calling this out. Let's take a look. In the Facebook post where Gregory is distancing himself from memoirs, we have the sentence from his post that says, I had no clue until I was half into the 18 hours of recording how loony the book was. Well, 18 hours is 1 plus 8, which equals 9, and halfway through 18 is also 9. So Gregory dropped two 9s in the post. When we invert the 9s, we get 66, or the number of chapters in the memoirs of Billy Shears. Intentional? I'll let you decide. Okay, friends, that's it for this video presentation. Even though I'm not focused on Billy and the conspiracy as much as I used to, I have said I will jump back in when significant and interesting news comes forth. And with the linking of the lyrics with memoirs, that to me qualifies as interesting and significant. And let's face it, sometimes it's just fun to try and solve the puzzle. The comments section is open. Thanks for watching and have a great day.